2021 KCSE Chemistry Paper 2 Question number 5 The Periodic Table and Electrical Conductivity Welcome Let's learn together Part A of the question Figure 3 shows part of a periodic table So here we are a few elements have been put in the grid and it is figure 3. So moving straight to the questions, select from the table the most reactive metal. So the metals normally occupy the left hand side of the table and what we know is that metals react by loss of electrons. So what does it mean? It means the bigger the atomic radius, the larger the atomic radius, the more reactive the metal is. So if you look at the metals, cesium or the one that has had the formula CS would be the most reactive. So the answer here would be as easy as that for a half a mark simply because it is the metal that has the largest atomic radius. What about non-metal? Non-metal we shall look at halogens here because group 8 elements are generally not reactive. So for this the smaller the atomic radius the more reactive the non-metal is. The reasoning is that they react by gaining extra electrons. So the answer becomes fluorine or F as per our table. For a half a mark, select an element with the highest fast ionization energy. So here now we shall go to the column of noble gases and we pick the one with the smallest atomic radius so the answer here would be our helium or he for one whole mark well moving on to the next page name the method used to obtain argon from its source and this one we all know, we do fractional distillation of liquid air. If somebody or if a student just wrote fractional distillation or just frax, fractional distillation of air, all those would still score. Now, give one industrial use of argon. Argon has so many uses, so we want to list as many as possible, but a student was just supposed to give one. So the first use is in fluorescent bulbs, which can also be called lamps. We can also use argon in radioactive, radioactive dating. We also use iron in dilution of oxygen, okay? This oxygen is normally used by patients with breathing difficulties. So we don't just give them pure oxygen. We have to dilute it with some argon. Argon is also used in arc welding arc welding we also use argon in forensic medicine how this is done is a story for another day so in forensic medicine we also use argon in high speed printing We 
were told that when you are giving uses, kindly avoid what we call wrong commitment. For example, you find a student writing that in the manufacture of fluorescent bulbs, if you wrote that, we deny you the mark because it would mean that fluorescent bulb that is tangible is actually manufactured using argon. So to avoid that, just tell us in fluorescent bulbs. That one has no commitment to where argon is being used in the bulb. So you don't commit yourself wrongly. But please, if you are asked to give a use. Moving on to the same question, explain each of the following observations. The melting point of lithium is higher than that of potassium. So these are all group one metals. The answer here is very easy. The metallic bonds in lithium, in lithium, the metallic bond, sorry, in lithium is stronger than in, than that in potassium. You do not have to talk about the size of the atom and so on, just go straight to the point the metallic bond is stronger. Now, the melting point of chlorine is lower than that of iodine. These ones are now uh, what we call halogens, and they have Van der Waals forces. So, to complement the answer here, you just tell us that the Van der Waals forces in iodine are stronger than those in chlorine. We have not been asked to explain why the Van der Waals forces are stronger in chlorine. So just leave your answer the way it is. That for one mark. Though, somebody would also write that uh, iodine has more Van der Waals forces than chlorine. Meaning there are many, there are more. Okay? So that raises the melting point. Another person could also say that um, iodine has stronger forces of attraction than those in chlorine. But I think what we have written here is as good as being the best answer you could ever give. Now that for the lithium and potassium, we have compared the metallic bonds. Moving on, the following ions have the same number of electrons. Nitride ion, magnesium ion, oxide ion and sodium ion. Arrange them in the order of increasing ionic sizes and give a reason. Now, if you look at uh, magnesium, magnesium has 12 protons because it is number 12 on or in the periodic table. Nitrogen has 7. Oxygen has 11. I mean, uh, oxygen has uh, eight, sorry, and sodium has 11 protons. So here, when you are to arrange, we will just compare a simple thing. That is the nuclear charge. How strong are they? And because we are told increasing, you'd start with the smallest. The smallest here is the one that has the highest number of protons, the one that has the strongest nuclear charge. So the biggest would be, the smallest, sorry, would be magnesium ion. This would be followed by next, which has 11 protons, sodium. Then next is oxygen or oxide. And finally, we had nitrogen. The reason being, this one here, is the smallest because it has a very strong nuclear charge that has very many protons pulling the valence electrons. And then this one would be the biggest because it has the fewest number of protons, if there's such a word like fewest. So I believe now you've understood why the order has to go this way, okay? So the reason is, 
we are told to give a reason. So this order would be one mark, and the reason is another mark. So you say that the reason is number of protons actually decrease. The number of protons decrease from magnesium to nitrogen. This would be a very good reason for that order. Somebody would also talk about nuclear attraction for outer electrons decreases from magnesium to nitrogen. So we may also talk about nuclear attraction for the reason as to why the order is as it is. Good. Proceeding with the other questions, the other part of the question, this one now talked about electrical conductivity. So use table 4 to answer the questions that follow. So table 4, we had property, melting point, boiling point, electrical conductivity at room temperature, and electrical conductivity in molten state. Start with H. Melting point, both melting and boiling points are above room temperature. So in terms of states of matter, this must be a solid. How do you identify solid liquid gas? Very simple. Melting point and boiling point are above 25 for a solid. Melting point is below 25. Boiling point is above 25. That is a liquid. I repeat, melting point below 25, boiling point above 25. That's a liquid at room temperature. Then lastly, to know if a substance is a gas, both melting points and boiling points are below 25 degrees Celsius. That is a simple criteria for knowing the states of matter of substances at room temperature. So moving on, I, again you can see both melting and boiling are, be, are above 25 degrees Celsius, so it's another solid. J is a liquid because melting point is below 25, but boiling point is above 25. So J becomes a liquid. K is obviously a gas because you can see both melting and boiling points are below 25 degrees Celsius. We are still studying our table before we get to answer our questions. Now let's move on to electrical conductivity. H is conducting, does not conduct at room temperature, but conducts in molten state. Now, which type of conductivity does H exhibit? This is called electrolytic conductivity. Okay? Now, for I, it doesn't conduct both in uh, at room temperature and in molten state, so this is just a non-conductor. For J, it conducts both at room temperature and in molten state. So this is what we will call metallic conductivity. K is another non-conductor. So getting back to conductivity, if H is conducting only in molten state, we know that the particles involved here are ions. So when the ions are not mobile, it is not conducting because probably our solid is still in solid state. So those ions are immobile. But the moment you melt it, the ions are set free or are set mobile and therefore your H conducts. For J, the particles involved are what we call delocalized electrons. So even before you come to answer your questions, you need to analyze your table so that you know what kind of conductivity each substance exhibit. Now, identify a substance which is a gas at room temperature. You can see now your question. The answer becomes K. Why? Boiling point 
is below room temperature. Now that we have discussed how to identify the states of matter of a substance given the melting and boiling point. So that would be your answer there. Name the particle responsible for electrical conductivity in H. H conducts only in molten state. So I have just talked about it having ions. So a student would talk about ions, you would also even talk about mobile ions. And for once this year, uh, free ions were also given marks. But uh, personally, I don't like the word free because uh, uh, nothing actually, <laughs> nothing and even nobody is free in this world. So let's avoid the word free. Uh, mobile is better. For J, J here conducts both at room temperature and in molten state. So here we will talk about uh, electrons or to be specific, delocalized electrons. Lastly, identify the type of forces that hold particles together in H. Which particles are here? That is an ionic substance. So we have ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are also called electrovalent bonds. Electrovalent bonds or forces. And you may even call them electrostatic electrostatic forces. So all those are the particles that hold the particles together in H. How do we conclude that because it conducts only in molten form, we know it's an ionic substance. For K, K is a non-conductor here, whether at room temperature or in molten form. So think of it being molecular for that matter the forces that hold the particles are Van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces, or you can talk of them as intermolecular forces. Yes, that marks the end of our question on periodic table for the year 2021. Continuing to wish you all the best. This is the Kenyan teacher. Thank you.